Today is an anniversary. 32 years ago, this third Sunday in July, I came to be your pastor. Thank you, I didn't ask for that. I want to express my appreciation to Stan for giving me the privilege to come and speak to you. I deeply appreciate the work he is doing here and I think he's doing an excellent job. This passage of scripture that was read to you is one of my favorite. As I've told you before in my college work, I majored in psychology and I can see a lot of psychological things going on here in the mind of Nathaniel. When Philip came and told him that he had found the Christ, Nathaniel with skepticism said, can anything good come from Nazareth? It's sort of like somebody in Oak Ridge saying, can any good teacher become the principal of Oak Ridge High School? Or have I touched some touchy nerve here? You read the papers. Maybe he was also thinking in terms of there had been no record of any great leader coming from Nazareth and no prophecy concerning thereof. And so he viewed with skepticism. He just didn't have great expectations for anything good to come from Nazareth. And so Jesus tried to explain to him that he knew who, who he was when he was sitting under the fig tree, which was a place where you, go, where you went to study the Torah. That surprised Nathaniel, and he then began to have expectations of Jesus. And Jesus said to him in something that I would like to characterize as just a good old lay, lay person's hillbilly expression, he would say it something like this, I think. Nathaniel... Bro, you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what he was trying to say. Nathaniel, you, you're, going to see, you're going to see great things coming. You're going to see angels coming and descending. You're going to see glory ahead. He had to raise his expectations. Our expectations are important in our lives. If you have none, your life will be bored. If you have too great expectations, you will become frustrated and have a sense of failure. But if you have godly expectations, you will experience life which is rich now and forever. I want to share some things with you this morning that I've never shared with you about my life. Maybe only piecemeal in the years I was here. My first real dawning of life occurred when I was about four or five. First came when we lived on a tenant farm called the Phillips Farm in the outside of Greenville. I just remember a little bit there. But shortly we moved to the Davis Farm where my dad and mother were tenant farmers on the Davis Farm. I remember a lot of that. We lived in a little small tenant house, a run-down place. There were five of us children, mom and dad, and sometimes two other relatives who lived with us, an aunt and an uncle. How in the world nine people slept, I do not know. And we slept sometimes in the attic. And to get to the attic, there was a ladder which was nailed on the side of the wall. That was the way you, you would climb up there. And I remember as a child, I was afraid to climb to the attic. It was a great adventure of faith to climb that thing. And in that house, we had no running water. We had to carry it from a spring behind the Davis home. Carry it through the fields, over the creek, across the road. My three older sisters, who were at that time pretty much teenagers... They would go and carry buckets of water. And they got me a little pail so that I, as a five-year-old, could carry the water 
to the house with them. For entertainment, we had an old battery radio. And I remember this clearly. Every evening, we would turn it on. We would listen to, to, I think it was WCKY, Cincinnati, Ohio, to the uh, Suppertime Frolic. That was the name of the, uh, the thing. I remember that so well. Life wasn't really good there, but it got worse. I guess Daddy didn't do a good job tending the farm. Whatever it was, we had to leave. And that was shortly after the war, and it was hard to find a house to live in. So the only house we could find to live in was an old abandoned house. It was off a little gravel road. You went past the poor farm. That was where the indigent people stayed. They stayed, lived better than we did. We had to pass that, go up the gravel road, take off on a little lane, muddy lane, that led up a hill. You got on top of the hill, there was a little plateau, and on, there, on that plateau there was a ghostly looking house. Weather beaten, no one had lived there for a long time, the yard was full of locust trees. And when we got there, I sensed my sisters were in dismay. Things had been rough, but boy, they had hit the bottom now. This house was scary. You couldn't carry the water to this house. You had to put it in the back of your car and carry it such a long way off. My bedroom was an attached part of the house. We had no access to heat whatsoever. My sister and I slept in that bedroom. I asked her the other day, I said, she's 80 now. I said, how did we keep warm? She said, I don't know. We just kept piling on the covers. She said the house was so open that we had a, a linoleum rug in one of the rooms and when the wind blew, it would blow the linoleum rug up. And for entertainment, I, I don't remember having anything except one time there, I remember they bought me a coloring book and crayons. That, that was the fascinating thing. I just was, appreciate that so much. But for entertainment, for toys, I had to make up my own games. So I had been with Dad. Dad was a country preacher and never made any money at it. But anyway, he preached. And we would go to tent revival meetings and, and, and I could hear those, uh, hear those preachers preaching. And then usually they would have a uh, mic system with the great big horns, you remember probably seeing them, which they would broadcast to the whole community. But they'd have a mic on a stand. So I decided at that age I was going to preach. I got in one of the back rooms and I got my sisters who was sometimes sang as a trio in church, I'd have them to come in and be on my broadcast, my live broadcast. And I got me an old stick, a tobacco stick or a broomstick, and I put me an old tin can on it for the, to be the uh, microphone. I let them sing, and then I let off preaching, and I would just preach to beat the devil, hellfire and damnation. My face got red. I almost had a coronary at five. I want you to get that in mind now. That's the way we were at that time. That was what the Dean household had to face. Move it up 20 years, almost 20 years exactly. I am now a, a, a senior at seminary. I've gone through four years of college. This is my third year of seminary. I was graduating. A few months before that moment when I was thinking about this, I had already, I'll tell you what I was thinking about in a minute. Yeah, forgive him. But I, I married Marie the year before she had been crowned, this is serious, Queen Jezebel. <laughs> the intramural football league the year before, they had crowned her Queen Jezebel and somebody else King Ahab. And so I saw her and I decided I wanted to date Queen Jezebel. I thought it'd be a little exciting. Turned out to be a little disappointing, but 
I fell in love with her anyway. So we were married before our senior year. And so about around Christmas time, I saw, you know, she's teaching school and we're going to have to leave. What will I do? I don't have a church. Nobody has expressed any interest. I hadn't really explored anything, really. And so out of the blue, I got a letter. I got a letter from the pastor of the Central Baptist Church in Johnson City. At that time, the Central Baptist Church was one of the elite churches in East Tennessee. Over 2,000 members. A Gothic church. Huge pipe organ. It was equivalent to the First Baptist Church of Johnson City since there was no First Baptist. The elite of the people in town came there. The professors came there. And the students from the college came there. And they wanted me to be associate pastor. And to do half the preaching. And I thought, Lord have mercy. What is this little country boy going to be able to say and do in that church? Well, it was a life-changing experience. It opened my eyes to a lot of things and it gave me an education faster than anything I've ever done in my life. In those 20 years... Several things happened, and I share with you some of the experiences that happened to me. First of all, I recognize very shortly in life that life is not fair. When I went to school and I saw the other kids and the things they had, I was suddenly aware that I was on a different side of the track. When I went to play ball in the Little League in one year, I didn't have a glove. Couldn't afford a glove. So when I went out the outfield, I had to bum from a, a glove from the opposing team. Asked somebody would lend me a glove so I could play. I wanted to be a Boy Scout. I thought that would be one of the greatest things in life to be a Boy Scout. But dad and mom had another son, brother younger than me. They couldn't afford to give us money to go to the scouts and moreover didn't have transportation too far away. And when school came at Christmas time and they would ask, the teacher would ask everybody in the room to tell what they got for Christmas. I hated that. If you're a teacher, ne never do that. Never ask every, any kid what they got for Christmas. Let them volunteer, but please don't ask them. It was so embarrassing to have to say, you know, for Christmas you got clothes. You wouldn't be very specific because you didn't want to talk about shorts and underwear. <laughs> so life, I had to learn, wasn't fair. And it isn't really fair, and you have to learn to adjust to that. I've gone in the hospital and I saw, I have seen little children dying and parents looking at me and wanting to try to give an answer. Where is the fairness in life? It does cause you to think. In the Ted Turner's autobiography, which I'm reading, he lost his faith in God when his little sister died as a teenager with a terrible disease. It's hard to explain. Sometimes you have to say, you know, by and by, we'll understand it better. We have to have faith that God knows and He will answer it someday. I always had faith that in spite of my condition, things would be better. I believed that God could change things. That was my faith. I believed that there would be goodness in the land of the living. The second thing I learned, and that is, in life, there are some determinative forces at work over which you have no control. Did you ever stop to think what your life would be like if you had been born in Haiti? What would your life have been like if you had been born in the mountains of China? What if you'd been born back in the Middle Ages and you were a serf 
to a vassal over a lord, under a lord, rather. What would life be like? You had no control over that, where you would be born. You had no control over to whom you would be born. You had no control over your DNA. Every one of us has a different DNA, which programs us to look like we look, and to have certain abilities that we have, and yea, maybe even to have some diseases we may have. With a Dean clan, we're programmed to have heart difficulties. My grandmother died of heart problems when she was in her 50s. My dear sister died 10 years ago of a heart attack when she was 66. My mom died at 76 with a heart problem. My dad died at 76 with a heart problem. My sister, my brother, and I all had bypass surgeries in our 50s. It's programmed in our DNA. The only thing we can do is to take good health, do what the doctor tells us, and pray that God will extend our lives. But there are things in life over which you have no control. It was the given situation. My life, when I was five, there were things present over which I had no control and over which I could not immediately rectify. Some people go to such extremes as they say, well, everything that is is determined by God. I, I don't believe that. I believe there's a lot of tragedies that are brought on because of sin, because of people's decisions. Don't blame God for all the rapes and murders and incest and everything else that goes on in life. We do that. But some people go to extremes and they just say, well, it's determined by God. We could have, when we were in that horrible situation, say, oh, way, by the way, this is just our fate. This is just where God wanted us. We'll just have to accept whatever it is. And some people do that. They just accept what is as if, you know, God wills it and they do not try to better themselves. They just go on living as they are, saying that it is determined that it be that way. In our faith, we've had people who believed in predestination, believed that everything happened was willed by God. Even we had a split in Baptist circles. We had many years ago the free will Baptists that emphasized the decisions of men. And we had the other Baptists which emphasized Calvinistic teachings over the sovereignty of God. We're sort of modified Calvinists. God has certain things which He does and wills, and then there are certain things He lets us decide and do. It's not either or, it's both and. Well, Things did change in the Dean household. My uh, dear mother, bless her soul, she decided we had to have some money, so she went to work. She went to work in what was called the Austin Company in Greenville. She worked eight to ten hours a day, sometimes half a day on Sunday, on Saturday. All day she stood on concrete. And she took tobacco leaves and she stripped them with her hands. My mother's hands were always rough. They were always stained with tobacco. But she made enough money for us to go on Friday, and I went with her as a boy, to the grocery store to buy the meals for the weekend and for the rest of the week. It took most of the money she made. My dad tried to find other jobs that would make a living for him and us. He tried hard. It took him many years to find anything that really made him him money at. By the time I was a teenager, he had a good job. My oldest sister, at that time when things were bleak, she dropped out of school and became a janitor. A A lady janitor at Tusculum College taking care of the ladies' dorm. The girls who were there were from up north. I guess it was pretty humiliating for a southern girl to be a janitor to 
some Yankees. My other sister, sister number two, middle sister, she dropped out of high school too. Took a job in the elastic plant. When I turned 16, I knew if I wanted to have anything, I had to have a job. I learned that when I wanted to have a bicycle when I was 12. Dad couldn't give me one. I would lie awake at night when I'd go to bed and my friend would roam across the countryside at night on his bicycle. And he'd go by our house and he'd let out a Tarzan yell. I can do that, but I won't do it for you right now. I wanted a bicycle. Oh God, I wanted a bicycle. Parents couldn't afford it. I went to my dad and I said, Dad, if you'll let me buy a bicycle, I'll, I will go and on, get it on time, on credit. I'll take a job as a, as a paper boy and I'll pay for it myself. So I remember as a young man, about 12, going to Western Auto, picking out me a bicycle, going in debt at 12, making enough money each week to make my bicycle payment. So when I got 16, I knew if I wanted to have anything at all or do anything, I'd have to make the money for myself. I bugged the man at the, drugs, at, the, at the grocery store until at 16, he gave me a job. I worked my way through two years of college there at the grocery store. And I made a decision myself. I made a decision, you know, I need to go to college. Particularly when I felt the call to the ministry. I'd seen a lot of guys preach who didn't have an education. My dad tried to preach he only had about a 6th or 7th grade education. He always told me, son, you don't, don't make the mistake I made. Get you a good education. He gave me encouragement, but he had no money. So I kept my job at the grocery store for two years until I landed a student church my junior year. I had a decision to make. I had a decision whether I go to college. I made the decision... I made a decision that I was going to go to college and seminary, do it all in seven years, make good grades, pay my own way, take a full course load every semester. And I want you to know, God let me do it. There were times when I didn't know where the money was coming for the next semester, but I always had enough money for that semester. And so when I got that job at that church going out of seminary, I was flabbergasted. How in under God's son did I make it? It was just not my decisions alone. It was the love of others, the support of others, the people who helped me, my home church helped me, a scholarship where my mother worked helped me. Bless her soul. She had surgery, breast surgery, had cancer, had a radical mastectomy and it took out part of her arm. She wanted to go back to work so I wouldn't lose my scholarship. We made it with the help of God. If you live your life, you suddenly realize that there are key decisions in your life you will have to make for yourself. Nobody else can make them for you. You've got to make some decisions to turn your life around and ask God to be with you as you do it. They may not be the best of situations, but you make the best of what you've got and you pray that God will bless it and make something out of it. When I was in school, I remember reading a poem, Edward R. Sill, entitled Opportunity. It caught my attention as a young man and it became my philosophy. A great war, a battle was raging on the desert where there was a lot of dust and there was one man who was a coward. He was afraid to fight and so he would always stay at the edge of battle. That day he was envious he was envious of the king's son who had a mighty sword, a greater sword than he had, made of brilliant steel. 
He was unhappy with his lot, so he just broke his sword, threw it down in disgust, and left the battlefield, and he crept off as a coward. But along came the king's son. He was wounded, but he wanted to fight the battle, and he reached down in the dust, and he got a half sword, and he went out and he fought in the battle, and he won victoriously. He defeated his enemies with half of a sword. There are times in our lives when we only have a half of a sword. But by the grace of God, take that half of a sword and make something out of it. We may feel that we have not been blessed with the talents of a Nancy or a gift of, to sing like Perry Ward. But whatever gift we have got, we use it for the glory of God and we allow Him to make something of it. That became my philosophy. As a little country boy, many times I would shake at what I had to do. I would say, dear God, how in the world do I know how to do it or what to do with it? But my college professor always taught us in one of our classes, he said, never turn something down simply because you never have done it. Take an invitation and do something with it and learn. That I tried to do. But there's another principle. The other principle is this. God doesn't give you everything up front. He makes you wait for it. He makes you have faith. He makes you yearn for it. He makes you reach for it. He makes you ask for it. And He gives it to you day by day. Jesus taught, give us this day our daily bread. Many times in life, I did not know what was coming on tomorrow. I didn't know what was next. But I had faith and to believe that something good was going to happen. And eventually it did. I read many years ago this story that illustrates this point. A father said to his son one day, he said, son, I want you to go to the barn and do an errand for me. And he said, dad, it's dark afraid to go out there. I can't see it. He said, son, there's a lantern on the back porch. Go get it and light it. He did. And he said, I can't see the barn. His dad told him, well, son, lift up the lantern. What do you see? He said, dad, I see the tree in the middle of the yard. He said, well, son, go to the middle of the yard next to the tree. So he did. And he said to the son, what do you see now? He said, why, Dad, I see the gate of the fence. He said, son, go to the fence. He got to the fence. He lifted his lantern. His dad said, what do you see now, son? He said, well, I see the barn. He said, well, son, go to the barn. That's a story of my whole life. Piecemeal. You do something today, you do something at this church, and lo and behold, God opens another door and you go somewhere else. I had never heard of Clinton except when Brother Heifel was pastor here. I knew he was pastor. I'd never been to Clinton. I knew nothing about it. But one day a committee came out of the blue and asked me to come down here. And my wife and I, we came down here we came through South Clinton and we thought, Lord, have mercy. What in the world have you invited us to go through? <laughs> Had a cattle barn and all that junky stuff. But I still had faith. I still opened. Thought it was better. I have this experience. The wards, here, the wards are here. I never told them this experience, but we wandered around before we met the committee. We wandered around and we came up there and we saw the wards house. I said to my wife very facetiously, I say, I bet the pastorum is in this neighborhood. We just laughed. We thought that was funny to be able to live next to the wards. And lo and behold, what happened? The pastorum was right down the street from them. <laughs> but the Lord always just opened up doors. You didn't have to bang on them. They just opened. And I find that is true in life. You do the best you can today with what you got where you are and the door is open for you for something else. As I said in the first service, 
We Christians have got to learn to live on our tiptoes. We live on our tiptoes, looking, expecting something good to happen in our lives. I'm old, but I still expect some good things to happen in the land of the living. I'm looking forward Wednesday to be with my grandkids. That brings me great joy, and they like for old pop men to come and sit and watch movies with them. Last Wednesday, it was a great experience. They arranged the little room like a little theater. We went and gave all of them a, rented a couple of movies. They were silly. They were stupid. I sat there with them for a double feature. Laughed and had a big time. Life is wonderful. Why make it drab? Why make it sad? Why make it depressing? God is alive. You are alive. Do something with it. Expect God to do something in your life every day. Live with that sense of expectancy. It may be from Jonesboro. It may be from Oak Ridge. Or it may be from Lake City or Bryceville. Wherever you live, live with a sense of expectancy. Do like Oral Roberts used to say when he closed his broadcast. He would look. I loved this part. I didn't like a lot of things he said. But I loved this one thing that he, when he would look and he would say, something good is going to happen to you. I believe it. The Bible teaches it. Why don't you live it? Let us pray. Dear Lord, life is full of possibilities. Regardless of how poor we are or what shape we're in, there are possibilities. Regardless of how frail our bodies are and how weak and in pain sometimes they are, there are possibilities. Help us to open our eyes and open our hearts to what you are trying to do through us. So bless us in this service this day as we make decisions for the glory of God. Amen. I want to say simply this. You get from where you are to where you want to go by making a decision. God has let put you in control that much. But if you make the decision, God is willing to go with you if you've made the right one and bless you and enrich you. If you need to make a decision, like some in the first service did, Terry will be down at the front or I'll be down at the front, you're welcome to come and say, I would like to make this commitment to the Lord to open my life to possibilities here on earth for the glory of God. Let us stand and sing.